Thank you for joining us for a press conference to discuss the first of its kind private nonprofit university system. My name is Karen and I'm going to cover some of the housekeeping items before I turn it over to Otterbein's president, John Comerford and Antioch University Chancellor, William R. Groves, who will give brief remarks. Now onto the housekeeping. President and Chancellor Groves will be taking um, questions after their comments. So please feel free to enter your questions into the chat and I will facilitate asking as many of them as time allows. Next, a recording of this press conference will be sent to those who registered for this meeting, just in case you wanna confirm the language or the quotes. Resources are available to the media, include a copy of the press release, high resolution photos of the campuses, headshots of the presidents and chancellor, and their institutions and respective logos. Links to these resources have been added in the chat. Lastly, should you have any additional questions or needs after this press conference, please feel free to reach out to Teresa at the email address or telephone number that has been added to the chat. And with that, I would like to turn it over to President Comerford and Chancellor Groves. Well, thank you, Karen, and thank you everyone for joining us on this exciting day. We just got to do an announcement here on campus, and so it's nice to be able to do it with all of you. And uh, this is just an important moment in American higher education and, and how we serve our students and serve one another and how we think about higher education being collaborative, not competitive. This is a moment to stand up and serve more deserving students. And that's what this is about today. And so what we're announcing today with Otterbein University and Antioch University is we are co-founding an independent university system, as Karen just indicated. That system is designed to be scalable so that other institutions can, and we expect there will be continued interest. We're already talking to some institutions about scaling up, this up as we go. And it's designed to allow an institution like Otterbein to do what we're really good at, an institution like Antioch University to do what they're really good at. Otterbein's really good at traditional aged residential liberal arts education. And we're never giving that up. And that will be a separate and distinct program, separately accredited. Uh, Otterbein University and Otterbein Cardinals will not be changing. But we are going to, with Antioch University, jointly work in the adult education space. Uh, and that is graduate programs, professional development certificates, adult degree completion, because we recognize there are millions of underserved Americans looking for a hand up and some help getting the credentials they need to fill our workforce needs and make our world a better place. And so I'll let Bill talk a little bit about how that's gonna work. Great, thank you, John. Um, again, I'm Bill Groves, Chancellor of Antioch University. Uh, Antioch University has kind of been a system of its own starting in back in 1964, which I'll speak to more in a minute. But this uh, system that is envisioned here is focused on uh, expanding the opportunities for students across the country, certainly adult students, um, but others as well. Um, we have been in the adult education market, as I said, since 1964, when the college, Antioch College, um, started campuses all across the country that were intended to serve adult learners. It was called crazy at the time, but we ended up with 35 some different learning centers across the country, some of which still exist today and are part of this university. With 4,000 students and many of them are in graduate programs, but also degree completion programs, the focus has been and continues to be at Antioch on bringing education to students in multiple modalities, in multiple kinds of programs and serving adult learners beyond the 18 to 22 year old market. What Otterbein brings to the graduate market is a few programs that we would certainly bring to our campuses in California and Seattle and New Hampshire. Uh, we have programs that we would also bring to the Ohio market at Otterbein. Uh, there are programs that we would engage in some collaboration with Otterbein to um, either provide new concentrations in areas that we do not have the expertise that they do. Um, I'm thinking particularly of nursing in their case, but psychology and, and uh, counseling in our case. Um, and, uh, and also providing opportunities to their undergraduate students to um, get into a, a graduate program offered through this system um, that would be accomplished in less than the normal time period. So imagine three plus two programs, so three years of undergrad, two years of your graduate program, get you through a year earlier than you might otherwise do if you were 
moving to a new institution for your graduate degree after you graduated. Um, also four plus one programs. So expanding our geographical reach of the programs, the modalities of those programs, and fast tracks in those programs, and then of course new programs is the are the major opportunities for growth of this system. Um, we will also be focused on, and Antioch has been focused on lifelong learning and thinking about education is not ending with your undergraduate degree or even your master's degree. Um, and there are many aspects of lifelong learning, one of them being workforce or workplace learning. And I'd like John to speak to our focus on that. Yeah, we, we all the time, both Bill and I are engaged with major employers. We are workforce development organizations. I mean, we're preparing students to go out and serve in corporations and nonprofits and volunteer positions in their communities and be difference makers that lift us all up. And there is just not enough talent right now. We all know the, the, the and certainly in central Ohio, and I know lots of other places in the country, if not most parts of the country, just finding talent attracting and retaining great uh, employees is really an issue. And so we imagine not just launching programs and, and hoping students come, we imagine doing this work in collaboration with employers. Uh, and it's everything Bill just talked about, graduate programs, undergraduate degree completion programs, short-term professional certificates, all done with workforce development in mind. Uh, because we think there is room for partnership there. Higher ed has never done a great job at this, right? We sometimes launch a program and, and cross our fingers, and we really hope it's what employers want, as opposed to directly engaging employers in that process. Uh, we're coming to you live from Otterbein's Point building, where we actually have employers, corporations in the building as tenants, a condition of their lease as they work with Otterbein undergraduates and faculty members. And so it's expanding that concept to a national scale and building collaborative programs with those uh, who will end up employing our graduates to make sure we're intentional about that. So that's a common thread we need to focus on. We also need to focus on the common thread of mission. And I know Bill will talk about that. Great, thanks John. Uh, and just to um, add a little bit to uh, the workforce training and workplace training, um, we both view that as a social justice issue of expanding access and affordability we all know that not everyone goes to college and gets their um, you know, ultimate degree between 18 and 25. Many of them start careers. Many of them have families. Meeting them where they need to be met to extend their education is part of our uh, mission. Um, it's all about access and affordability. And these kinds of business to education partnerships is one way of providing those on-ramps to students who might otherwise not complete a degree, start a degree, or extend their education. Um, it also is a way to get the employer to help pay for that educational opportunity in a way that they might not otherwise have done if they had done it on their own um, uh, at a younger age. So let me talk about mission because I think that um, as we have approached thinking about engaging in a system approach to education and meeting the needs of employers and, and adult learners in, a, in, in this nation, Mission is part of that, and it's a big part of it. I really want to emphasize that this is not just a business plan. This is a way of these two institutions and those who may join us later to expand upon our existing missions for educating for social justice, the common good or public good, and democracy. I don't think anyone can be listening to these January 6th commission hearings without understanding that higher education owes this nation more than career preparation. It has always been the case that education is the great equalizer in society, that it is also uh, an essential element of a strong democracy, whereas ignorance is just the exact opposite. It is the lifeblood of tyranny and author authoritarianism. So this is a system that is built on a new business model, but also built on extending that mission. Anyone coming into this system will be part of that kind of a mission. And we expect that there are many out there who do this, who understand that obligation and will continue to uh, work toward that. Uh, our first president is Horace Mann, the father of public education in America. He was an ardent abolitionist in 1852. 
Uh, Antioch was one of the first schools to admit blacks and whites in the same classrooms, women in the same classrooms, and women faculty. I come to find out, however, that we were beat at all three of those items by Otterbein University, <laughs> who had, had been incorporated five years earlier than Antioch. So uh, we feel we were both at the forefront of making sure that education and higher education was available to all individuals, that in order to sustain democracy, that there was an opportunity for a very pluralistic and diverse group of students engaged in that process. That's been part of our mission and Otterbein's mission uh, since the beginning. Um, this is values-based education. It's not just career preparation. Um, I think that it could not be a more important time in this nation's history for higher ed in this kind of a system approach to rededicate itself to be democracy's universities. And that is our focus. So thank you. Just by way of, of wrapping it up before we move on to Karen facilitating questions, uh, this we think is the beginning of something. There's been a lot of work to get to this point. Trust me, there's been a lot of work to get to this point. But we expect this is a movement moment in American higher education, that there are lots of institutions thinking about how they can serve more students, how they can find opportunities to expand, and how they can play to what they're great at and work together in areas where there are opportunities that maybe they're not currently right for. And that's what this is about. This is a system that we have found it very advantageous to start with two partners, but we are in other conversations and we expect the phone will start ringing even more after today about what this can gr grow into. And that is a national university system where we allow individual traditional undergraduate programs to remain distinct and separately accredited, but we will work collaboratively in the graduate and adult learning and professional development space where there are so many opportunities to help in workforce areas, help in social justice areas, help in equity areas. And we think that will motivate a lot of institutions as we move forward. So with that, we're probably ready to take those questions. You're on Thank mute. you so much. We really appreciate this. And um, feel free to put your questions in the chat. We do have our first one. Um, it's a, it's, there's two questions in it. So I'll read the whole thing and then we can go from there. Um, when do you envision this being fully operational? And how do you plan to address the costs of taking this on, especially when it comes to affordability and offsetting that? John, would you like to start? Sure, I'm happy to start. Operationally, uh, we will be launching into, uh, our we're both Higher Learning Commission accredited, and obviously this will be a conversation with them. We've already engaged them at this point, but we don't have approval yet to be able to move forward. And also Department of Ed and all those things for getting good signals, but need to, to do that work. So we imagine that's gonna take most of the next year. And so think of the next year as this is our chance to engage all, all of our faculty, staff, students in this conversation, engage employer partners, engage other potential higher ed partners, so that when we get those approvals, probably a year from now, we'll be able to hit the ground running in the fall of 23 and be launching new programs, new sites, and, and new partnerships with employers and so forth and so on. As for the cost issue, we've hit a couple of these. One is accelerated degree pathways. If we can get students to a bachelor's and master's degree and beyond in accelerated pathways, that's one less year of tuition and one more year of employment and income. So that's an important, powerful one. Bill mentioned employers. The more we partner with employers, I'm meeting with employers, major employers in central Ohio all the time. They're desperate for workforce and they are very open to processes by which they would subsidize the, the education of students in these programs if they had a crack at, at hiring them at the other end, which is great for students. Everybody wins. The employer wins, the student wins, the university wins. Everybody wins in that regard as an affordable pathway. And I'd say the most important thing is this is a collaboration of nonprofits. The goal here is service first. The goal here is mission first. And so obviously we will need revenue streams to be able to pay our faculty and staff and deliver the programs. But the goal is to do this as an affordable and accessible program as possible. That's in the heart of the access and affordability mission. Um, let me just add a couple of comments. Um, certainly access and affordability is one of the focuses and John's laid out a number of those um, aspects of how to keep the cost down for students. Um, we also will be unbundling degrees 
So students in these, these uh, kind of certificate and badge programs can be working toward a degree without paying for the whole degree. Um, they may never finish the degree, but they're at least getting uh, a, a, an on-ramp toward that degree, uh, hopefully paid for in, in large part, if not completely, by the employer. So that's definitely an affordability issue and an unbundling and reimagining how we credential people in higher education. Uh, and the last thing I would add is that we will be more focused on diversity, um, and Antioch has launched a campaign to raise um, more funds for a diversity scholarship fund, and I see that being ongoing work. Donors like to know that they're going to have an impact, and I think that announcing this system is a big part of continuing with that uh, fundraising campaign around diversity scholarships. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is in regard to governance. Can you give any insight into the governance structure? Will you have shared board members? And will one person be president of the entire system? Bill, do you wanna start this one? Yeah, so we have not ironed out all those details and we still, of course, are talking and working through that. Um, there are a lot of uh, federal regulations that we need to work through, but this will be, an in integration of these two entities and while they'll keep their corporate status, um, a board will be a system board at some point. Um, and we will have uh, shared, we will have members from both institutions on that board and it may include members of any another, another affiliate that comes on board. John and I are also very committed to attracting members to that system board who would not necessarily have been involved in either one of our institutions or third parties institutions, but who are going to bring to that board an understanding, a deep understanding of higher education, higher education finance and academics within higher education. Uh, we all have members like that on our boards, but we, uh, we need to be looking for new talent in that respect in terms of board membership. And uh, we will continue to do that. That's right. I would only okay. add, I'm sorry, Karen, go ahead. No, say, would you like to add to that? Sure. Just briefly, Bill covered it all pretty well. Um, our boards have been deeply engaged yeah. in this conversation. We've been uh, getting good counsel as we went and getting the structure in place. And we understand the, 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 what's unique about what we have in mind is this is not a merger, not an acquisition. There, there is no disappearance of either institution in this process. There's understanding that at a system level, there'll be work to do, and so there will be a system board working on, we'll do some shared services, looking for efficiency and better service delivery, also looking for ways that students can move seamlessly through the system. So for example, we'll need the same learning management system so that students can move seamlessly from an Otterbein course to an Antioch course. Right. Faculty members at Otterbein will be able to teach graduate courses in the system. And so there's an understanding of what happens at the system level and what happens at the quote unquote campus level uh, and maintaining the structure of the campus level from shared governance up through boards. Yeah, let me add one thing I meant to mention. Uh, first of all, you asked a question about um, the administrative team for the system. There certainly would be one built over time. Um, and of course, the system would have a CEO at some point. I don't think it's immediately. Um, we also envision that the system would be the place that would house the shared services part of an affiliation, uh, part of the advantages of an affiliation model is that we can move some of the back office work into a shared services model. Um, there's a lot of IT that needs to happen to cause that to be, you know, a possible, um, including um, integrating our ERP system and possibly also integrating our learning management platform. So, there's technology that will need to happen, certainly have a vision of shared services that will both do two things, improve capacity for the system beyond what either of the members could do in this case, or any new member, the capacity building, and two, cost containment. So uh, we could eliminate some duplicity, du duplication, excuse me, uh, and uh, build capacity at the same time. Perfect, thank you. Um, our next question, were there any stats when it came to student enrollment or the lack thereof in completion that pushed this affiliation collaboration forward? I'm happy to start on that one. 
Uh, we certainly did market research on this uh, and found the results very encouraging and that has pushed us forward. And so we tested a couple of things. One is we imagine your traditional undergraduates, so your 18 year olds when they're choosing a traditional university like an Otterbein or hmm. potentially other members, we would be able to market something to the effect of the intimacy of a small college with the power of a large university behind it. Because those undergraduates would have accelerated degree programs, they would have more corporate partnerships and internship sites and job placement opportunities and study abroad opportunities. So they would have a lot of the opportunities that you get at a larger university, but you don't give up the small intimate campus. And when we described that, the response was overwhelmingly positive in, in the survey results that 88% of survey respondents from that traditional population was more likely or much more likely to apply to a traditional school like Otterbein that was a part of a system that would offer those benefits. So we know where to focus there. We also tested adult learners and, and sort of described what we had in mind here about leveraging the assets of multiple institutions, uh, being workforce connected and all the things you've heard described and actually tested that against some large university competitors that may be better known for their graduate schools and, and found that actually the same thing was true there. In fact, we tested it against, I won't name the other large university, but a cross app large university and found that 77% of adult learners would have picked our system over that large university. And so there's very encouraging market research that helped nudge us in that, that this was, there was something to this idea that was really gonna work. Um, and let me add to that, thanks John. Um, we had, uh, we have not had an enrollment decline. That's not something that's pushing us. In fact, uh, I think Otterbein has been very stable with enrollment despite changes in the demographics in undergraduate with 2,700 students or so. We have about 4,000 students. We actually have had a 10% increase in our enrollment during the fiscal year 21 and another 5% increase in fiscal year 22 during the pandemic. Uh, what we've learned is a lot of our adult students really very much appreciated, um, you know, the non-place-based Zoom approach to teaching, and that had an impact on our enrollment. It, we are not really, a, you know, wedded to place. Uh, we are an institution that um, takes learners wherever they are. We have a lot of uh, low residency programs where people can learn from wherever, um, and on their own for the most part, but then coming together for residencies in a place-based model. We have some online programs um, and we have uh, an intention to grow those, but we thought that um, as we were approaching notions of growth, that one of the pillars of growth is affiliation. And we wanted to do that now and not wait till that consolidation of the higher education market passed us by we decided three years ago to pursue this and 18 months ago started this in a much more strategic process um, uh, in a deliberate process than just waiting for people to knock on our door. And that's what got us into this conversation with Otterbein. Uh, we went through a, a process with a consultant that first started with 60 invitations for a conversation to various institutions we felt met our criteria. And then worked through all that in the last 18 months and Otterbein landed on top um, for many reasons, much of it dealing with their uh, mix of academic programs, but also um, their mission and history and heritage of that mission. So um, I think that answered your question, but there was one other question, Karen, that came back and I, about the last question about uh, 990 and I wanna answer that. Yes. Um, in a consolidated, uh, excuse me, in a, in a system approach like this, there would be a consolidated financial statement. Uh, the individual institutions would still have financial statements. I believe, and I'm only going to answer this off the cuff, that there would be 990s filed by the independent, by each of the individual institutions. I'm not sure about whether a 990 would be required uh, with the filing of a consolidated financial statement, but perhaps. Right. I'm just going to, Bill was answering um, just a follow up to the governance question about if the system would file a single 990 and um, where will the systems office or headquarters be located? All right. Well, Antioch is not in a headquarters. <laughs> I am in Ohio. Uh, I have most of my team spread out all over the country. I have a, 
uh, a, a cabinet that is in four states at least, uh, New York, California, Washington, um, and Ohio. Um, and uh, so I don't really think of headquarters as a, as a place. There will be no transactions regarding real estate in this deal. I don't imagine my cabinet will be moving. Um, and I don't think John's cabinet or he will be moving. So the world has changed. We do business by Zoom every day. <laughs> I don't know, Bill. I might want to move to your Santa Barbara campus. We <laughs> might have dibs on that. <laughs> I, I might want to, you know, don't, don't preclude that possibility. Now, I, yeah. I think these are, the, the, the governance and structure questions are important. And, and you can tell we have a conceptual thing, but need to go through the accreditation process, the Department of Education process, and all that stuff before we solidify finally all that stuff. But what they speak to these sorts of questions is, I think, something that has gotten in the way of collaboration in higher ed. And that is, institutions are worried about losing their brands, losing their identities, losing their independence. And I think we've found this balance here where a, a place like, I'll just speak for Otterbein. We can keep an Otterbein University undergraduate curriculum in the way that all of our alumni would recognize. There'll be these new opportunities for students in connection with these shared programs. But then we can, so we don't have to give that up uh, in order to leverage into with partners into the grad and adult space that we know we need to get into for mission reasons and for demographic reasons and everything else. That's where we have to go. And so there's this balance where there will be some roles for the system to play and shared services and some of these shared grad and adult programs, but the distinctive undergraduate programs aren't sacrificed in that process, which is we think what's going to be attractive about this model as something new in higher ed. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, are there any more media questions? If so, please put them through chat. Great, we have one more, thank you. Um, would this compare similarly to the Claremont Colleges at all? No, the Claremont Colleges is mostly a uh, consortium uh, contractual agreement between the parties, mostly uh, I think related to their library, uh, their shared library. This is very much different. Um, this is not a contractual affiliation or excuse me, a contractual um, articulation agreement. Uh, this is an affiliation. There is going to be a legal and corporate, um, you know, integration of this in a way that is much more than a contractual uh, kind of uh, consortium. Those are mostly shared service organizations. There's the Ohio Five, that's a, a shared service organization. There's a consortium in Indiana. Um, they're very different models. They don't really view themselves as, uh, I know there's some sharing of students and degrees in the Claremont system, but it's very minimal. Um, this is more a way of aligning schools um, that bring their own portfolio programs to this system and offers them up to all of the other students in the system. And that's certainly true of the graduate schools that will be part of the system. Yeah, I'm not an expert on the Claremont model. We've certainly looked around at some of the systems out there and Bill's right that I think you'll find some elements, but no other system that we could ever find that's like what we're setting up here. And so we're talking about sort of three areas of emphasis and that's one is shared services. And you'll see more models of that out there where schools have decided to get on the same ERP and, and work together and find some efficiencies and deliver better services as a result. Um, there is the undergraduate, so the traditional undergraduate collaboration so that we imagine, especially as other undergraduate institutions, uh, traditional undergraduate institutions join up, there's chances to, to you know, have more study abroad opportunities and, and collaborate and to widen the student experiences without giving up the, the distinctiveness of the individual campus experience. But then the most important thing here is the true uh, bringing together of graduate and adult programs uh, and trying to be a player at scale in that space. And, and so for a place like Otterbein or places like us, it's a question of, do you wanna to try to do that on your own, given that you probably don't have the right structures for it, probably don't have a big brand in that space, or do you wanna do that together? And our answer was, we're gonna be better together here. Uh, and we found the right first partner in Antioch, and I think we'll grow from there. That is, thank you. Any other media questions? We want to put them through now. Well, John or Bill, do you have any final statements or anything you want to leave us with? 
Uh, other than saying we're certainly uh, open to having follow-up questions from anyone on this panel, uh, if you think of anything else you'd like to discuss, um, ha uh, Karen, are you going to share uh, Teresa's contact information? And yep, we'll get in touch. Right. Um, I'm excited. I don't know if I've conveyed that yet, <laughs> but I'm very excited. And I think that this is a really big step for higher education to move back to its roots and to provide value-based education, supporting uh, our, our, our role in supporting the public good and the common good in democracy. And uh, also on business, you know, I think there's for too long, higher education has viewed themselves as part of an ivory tower. Um, offering up degrees without much thought about how, what the needs of business is within our communities. We wanna be, we wanna be in that space of collaborating with the businesses and bringing to them what they need um, and connecting our degrees with the jobs and the corporations in our communities. Yeah, that, that's all exactly right. And I would only add that the time is right, right? Wow. Our, our, our uh, our students, we, there are many more students to serve that higher ed has often not done a good job of serving. And this is a chance for social justice and equity to better serve those, especially adult learners that have not always been well served by our system and scale up into those areas. It's a time where we have huge workforce needs. And so our employer partners are going to want to be a part of this, I'm sure. It's the right time for higher ed. We are not the only institutions thinking differently about new models and, and how we move forward in mission aligned ways that are also the right business decision. And I think it's the right time for our country in general. We need leadership right now. We need to create active, engaged citizens that are ready to participate in our democracy. And, and so it just feels like the time is right uh, and we're excited to be at this point. And, and with this, we'll grow in all sorts of interesting ways as, as we go forward, some of which we can predict and some of which we probably can't, but it's gonna be exciting. Exciting indeed. Thank you very much. And um, as Bill noted, Teresa has shared um, the information. If you need any background information or to reach out to her, if you want any additional quotes, comments, interview time, we are, we are here to help. And um, we will be following up with a link to the recording of this press conference, a transcript and copies of all the other resources. So thank you all very much. Thank you. And thanks thank you very much, Karen. Thanks, everybody. Yes, thank you very much.